Coming to you from New York Central Park, it's the summer edition of House of Style. We'll look at what some models consider sexy, tattoos is the latest rage in accessorizing, and how the fashion community supports a cause while looking fabulous. Hi, I'm Cindy Crawford. Welcome to the summer edition of House of Style. Central Park is a hotbed of frolic and fun, as I'm discovering with my blading guru, Joel Rapp, author of The Complete Blader. Inline skating is probably one of the summer's sexiest sports. It gives you a chance to strut your stuff in the sun while wearing some great outfits, but that's just my opinion. We decided to ask three top models who specialize in sex appeal to tell us what turns them on. Sexy is something that you want to touch. If you don't want to touch it, it's not sexy. When you put on sexy clothes, I think your attitude changes. I like this outfit because it's frivolous, because it has a sense of humor. I mean, after all, I mean, if you can't laugh about it, it can't be sexy. I don't think it's so much um, what you're wearing or what you... Maybe that has a little bit to do with it. I think it's more... It's inside. It's an attitude. Here's an outfit that I consider really sexy, and it just it definitely says that somebody has a... Um, individual opinion on life. The shaved head, combat boots which are sexy, you know, like contrast, you know, between something really conventional and something really, like, outrageous. Sometimes trashy is really sexy. Yeah, I mean, you know you get in a trashy mood. That's true. Sometimes trashy can work, but trashy, trashy usually has to work at home. I am a powerful force. What kind of sex is advertising? I don't know. It's really obvious, and I don't think it's part of many people's real lives, but I think it's a big part of people's fantasy lives. Yeah. I think you don't have to show everything. I think just keeping a little bit back is, is it's nice to have something for the imagination. Flesh is sexy, just, though. One thing I think that's kind of sexy about, like, being in front of the camera is that it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of freedom. You can just do what you want and not worry about some guy attacking you on the street. And that level of freedom is really sexy. Who's real sexy? <laughs> Prince is sexy, but in a very freaky way. Men really don't make an effort like that, you know, to sort of like, you know, give you like that visual sexual delirium like women do for men. And Prince extends himself like that. Axel sexy. There's that kind of really tardy, sexy, like Madonna. You know what Let commercial is it. really sexy? Is I want to be like Mike. It's always nice to see Michael Jordan in a tank top and shorts. Fashion goes from this to that to that to that. I mean, to long skirts, to short skirts, to this and to that. But um, it's the person that's wearing it that gives the appeal. The essence of like really being sexy is how comfortable you are with yourself. Thanks, ladies. Tattoos were once the badge of the outlaw, but now they're as mainstream as perms and platforms. Let's take a look at tattoo mania and discover why so many people are willing to go under the needle these days. I was really spontaneous. Like, I'd never really wanted a tattoo. I just kind of did it. <laughs> Cut me a loop. Do it. Every young kid today has a tattoo. Every rock musician has, like, four or five of them. Every once in a while, one of the models will turn up with a new tattoo. It's most definitely the ear piercing in the 90s. I have a tattoo with my husband's initials on it. Due to certain role models, be it Axl Rose or Cher, tattoos have become more acceptable to most people. It's like a secret. Like, people reveal them to you, and you all share them. You find the weirdest people, or the most normal people you wouldn't expect to have them, have them. Another reason for the popularity of tattoos is the quality of the tattoo artists. Indeed, many of them have graduated from recognized art schools. If this was drawn on a piece of paper, you'd still say it was amazing, you know? I mean, it's harder to draw on skin. In my business, 60 to 70 percent is women. They usually get something dainty and feminine. Mine's very small and in a discreet place, so I see it for myself, and that's, you know, what's important. It's not to show anyone else, it's to have for myself. Today, women are becoming independent and choosing to do what they want. Some people just want to get one tattoo, and that's all they ever want to get. I mean, I said that after my first, and second, third, fourth tattoo. Now I just know I'm always going to get tattooed. As you get one, it's just like, when's the next one? Where's it going to be? What is it going to be? I like the colors. Like when I get up, if you know, you don't feel good sometimes, but you always have color, and always like makes you feel better. 
just regular tattoos aren't for everybody, so you got to have something for the weekend warriors. The temporary tattoo is a fashion accessory. You can use them like a cosmetic. Wherever you want the eye to go, that's where you would use a tattoo. I kind of like to decorate every inch of skin possible. And with summer being so bare and so much skin showing, I thought, like, well, I might as well, like, fill in the spaces with tattoos. Working as a professional, um, tattoo sometimes isn't good for your image, so we can take it off and the next day you can get a new one put on with no pain at all. Who has the real ones and who doesn't? Only their uh, tattoo artist knows for sure. People spend more time trying to find a good hairdresser than they do finding a good tattoo artist. Go to somebody that's reputable. Make sure that they sterilize because there's a lot of diseases out there. Talk to people that have tattoos and think about what it is that you want, why you want it, where you're going to put it, and how you're going to display it for the rest of your life. Life's uncertain, but tattoos, tattoos are forever. Before you decide to get a tattoo, make sure you really want it. Unlike some relationships, they're pretty much for keeps. Coming up, we'll go behind the scenes of my Pepsi commercial. We'll chat with Olympic swimmer Dara Torres, and we'll investigate some things you just can't live without this summer. But now let's look at the fashion event of the season, the second annual Don't Bungle the Jungle, which brought together designers, models, and celebrities for a jungle-inspired fashion show. The proceeds of over $150,000 go towards saving the rainforest. Fashion can raise a lot of bucks. We are gonna have some fun tonight. Come on, let's go into the party, all right? Follow me, honey. Everybody made something special just for tonight, so this is the only place you can see it and the only place you can buy it. We've got uh, uh, a little reptile dress to auction off tonight to hopefully raise lots of money. I'm, you know, ready to be a top model if it has to be that way. I'm from Malaysia. There's a big forest, which is a, the most, the beauty of Malaysia. That's why when I when I was supposed to do this project, I really say yes. Once you get past the glitz and the glamour, you have to realize and, and understand that you're here for a purpose. We have to think globally and act locally. Welcome back to House of Style, coming to you from Central Park, where as many as 100 commercials are shot in a year. You may think making a commercial is glamorous. Well, it is, but it can also be exasperating. Take a look. This week, my job is uh, doing a new Pepsi commercial, and we've done a series of four or five, and most of them have these little old ladies in it, and it's sort of me getting to be glamorous and getting lots of attention, so I like it. Action! Here we Pepsi Cindy! Making a commercial is not what you think. 30 seconds of TV can take days or months to produce. On the set, every detail has to be perfect. And since I was the star, I guess that means me too. Everything I do, like I get all this attention, and it's kind of a joke. Because it's really, I'm wearing a short skirt with no underwear. Uh, you uh, Hated it. The commercial will never get on the air with that dress. It knocked the crew down. You know, it was like a tornado coming right through that room. It's spectacular. Now we're going back to the trailer. Then I go through this exercise of trying on maybe five things. And I'll pick up. But it's, I'm the only Indian, and there's like ten chiefs here. So, try number two. Maybe they like it, and maybe they won't. Well, they liked it. So we could finally get down to some shooting. 
Oh, this is terrible. I'm working with this guy. His name is Joe Pitka. He's a great director. He does like a lot of big Pepsi commercials, all the big Pepsi commercials. But he's a little temperamental. He's been known to call models Bim and Bo. And he goes, yo, Bim, Bo, get over here. Now, it's not very nice, and he hasn't done it to me yet, thank God. Start this way, Bim. I have a philosophy about a commercial. Even if you don't like the product or want the product or need the product, I want people to like the commercial. And what else am I doing? Sitting around in my trailer a lot and waiting for them to tell me it's time to come out on set and do something which takes about five minutes. Then I go back in my trailer for two hours. Don't make me wait. Don't make me wait. The next commercial was a spoof on how celebrities are hard to recognize without their makeup. I haven't seen any movie stars, have you? I am um, supposed to be like an actress. I bound a back lot and I come to work looking like this, like schlumpy, and uh, I go into my trailer and a guy hands me a Pepsi and when I come out of the trailer, I'm transformed. Where is she? Where is this? Where is this? And action, everybody. She comes out looking devastating and the uh, ladies are happy because they've seen the scene proper that they know and love. After four days, over 10 outfits, seven hairstyles, and I don't know how many cans of Pepsi, the director called it a wrap. <laughs> We're done. We just finished. I'm out of here. I'm flying to New York tonight on the red eye. Well, now you know. There's more to commercials than meets the eye. This season brings us the Summer Olympics. Its competitions will be watched almost as intently as the presidential race. We caught up with one of the Olympics' true stars, swim team captain Dara Torre. I love competing. <laughs> go to all the workouts and, and do all the aerobics and the running and the weights, but once you go to a swim meet and you stand up against you know, the top people in, in the country or the top people in the world, that's my favorite thing. My first Olympic victory, I won a gold medal in 1984, and I was 17 at the time. I don't know, I was so young, I just kind of did it, you know? After the 1988 games, I was very burned out. I hung up my suits, and I thought it would be for good. But after a couple years of absolutely not touching the water, I think I just really missed it and just thought I hadn't done what I was capable of doing, so I just decided to give it an another try. We swim around 5,500 and 7,500 meters a day, which is roughly around four to six miles. We do cross training, we do aerobics, we do stadium stairs. I normally run these, I normally do a hundred of them, but I hurt my ankle, so I have to walk them. When you're doing stadiums, you have to be motivated, think about the Olympics in order to do them because they're so hard and they're kind of a drag. I take weights really seriously and um, try to lift as much as I can. With the shape I'm in now, it's nice to be able to put on an aerobics outfit or, or any kind of, you know, exercise outfit and not go, oh my God, you know, <laughs> my fat here, my fat there. People want, wanting to be in shape really has brought out the fashion sense in um, workout clothes. Workouts are, are real intense. Once I leave the pool, though, I kind of try to have another life. If I were just to think about swimming all day and all night, I'd just drive me nuts. This is my all-time favorite picture. It kind of reminds me of, of when I swim or like before a race, I stand behind my block and I, I look down the lane and I just see nothing but water. I always like used to get scared like, oh my God, there's so-and-so swimming next to me or there, there's that person, you know, but now I just try to, um, you know, concentrate on my race and not worry about who I'm swimming against. Because maybe they're going, oh my God, there's Dara, you know? <laughs> Good luck, Dara. Coming up, we'll look at surfboard style, an unusual new clothing line, and a peek at anti-chic that could only belong to the Beastie Boys. But first, we're going to take a glimpse at some things you'll want, no need, to beat the summer heat.
Welcome back to House of Style. I'm still in Central Park enjoying a beautiful day. When most people think of towels, they think of drying themselves off, not dolling themselves up. But there's a whole new way to look at terry cloth. Check it out. Cloth terry is basically a cloth that has loops built on the surface. is actually officially the back of the fabric. The world of French terry really began with terry toweling. Translated now to apparel, one doesn't need the weight and the absorbency. I believe it's coming back because of the uh, move towards all this active sportswear. In the 60s, it was always casual. This time around is going to be much more decorative, much more dressy. There's many style ideas that can be utilized. It's a great material for summer because of the use of cotton. Cotton fabric being very, very absorbent is always very comfortable to the skin. Terry is worn by everyone. It's in the locker room, it's in the boudoir, it's in, on the beach. It is an all-American fabric. And terry cloth looks great, too. Summer's a time when surfers with boards of all shapes and sizes come out to ride the big kahuna. But did you know there's a whole science and art behind making the boards? Well, you're about to find out. <laughs> Wipe out! Just like fashion, you know, what your friends are wearing and everything like that. It goes for surfing just as well. You know, you want the cool board or the cool shape. And it's important. You know, like I said, you got to have the right equipment. Surf or die. You to surf or die. There is no one popular board. I think what's always important to remember is that you want to get the board that's best for you and also best for the conditions of where you're going to be surfing the most. <laughs> The board is a board, and there's a lot in the technology and how it's constructed and everything else, but the word out there is who's shaping your board. A surfboard shaper is somebody that shapes surfboards. Each person needs to have a different style of surfboard. So what I do is try to make sure that that style of surfboard goes to the right surfer. The board is an extension of the person. If he wants a certain type of board, he'll communicate with the shaper and gets exactly what he wants. The equipment plays a big part in surfing. I'd say maybe 30 to 50 percent of someone's success might come from the surfboard he rides. Well, we glass surfboards. The shaper can shape it because it's soft, and then the glass comes along and puts a shell on it. A hard shell which holds it together. Uh, if you didn't sand them, um, the board wouldn't ride as good. You would probably cut yourself on all this stuff, and I, I just clean it all up and get it smoother because it gives it a satin finish, almost a semi-gloss appeal. And uh, people like shiny things. A great surfboard is basically one that you're going to have the most fun on. I'll just stay on land, thank you. The former brats of rap, the Beastie Boys, seem to symbolize anti-chic, but their refusal to make a fashion statement has become a fashion statement. In fact, Mike D is part owner in a specialty shop in L.A. called Extra Large. We caught up with the guys to find out their ideas about style. We're standing in Extra Large store in East Hollywood, California. This is, you know, the shop you guys have been hearing about. Mike D's store, Beastie Boys. We have no style. They could be whatever sneakers you want. We prefer the classics here. We got the old school sneakers here too. Old school means basically they ain't making them anymore. We like the way these fit. We like the way they feel. Help us jump high when we play a nice game of basketball. Not to mention a nice little sexy show. Nice game of dominoes. 
Relaxing. I'm wearing an outrageously stylish outfit today. But you have what we call um, pants. The bigger they are, the better they are. And this is called a shirt. Some people call it a t-shirt. What's cool about t-shirts like this one, Con Art, you know, it's like, it's like the brand name that you're, you know, familiar with. It's like kind of industrial, but then it's got fresh, like kind of color graffiti thing. It's about taking whatever you find and making it work. Right, that's one rule. The second rule is there are no rules. A lot of the stuff that, that we're into, it's not like stuff that you can get anywhere. You gotta kind of search and seek, you know, that's part of like the whole thing of wearing it. I would say our most stylish moment is probably like after the shows, the whole band, like we all hit the showers together. That's when it gets really stylish. The sod color, a lot of people prefer, like compare it to AstroTurf. The key is finding those original, very functional, utilitarian, beautifully functional designs. You never can shake where you come from, you know what I mean? And I guess maybe that's, you know, just what we are. We like, you know, we wear them because that's, that's what we always wear. And I, like, I like that. I appreciate that about myself. And Adam, I appreciate that about you, too. I appreciate you. That about wraps it up for this edition of House of Style. We'll be back in August when I'll give you a few tips on how to stay fit without going crazy. See ya.